Good afternoon, everyone. So thank you for joining PHRC as we conclude our Women's History Month honoring human relations heroes. I am Dr. LaDawn Robinson, Regional Director for the Pittsburgh Regional Office. And today I ask you to sit back, tap in and stay tuned in for today's program is going to be inspiring. We will begin with opening remarks from our Executive Director, Chad Dion Lassiter. Following will be the introduction of our featured speaker. Now, time will be provided at the end of the program for questions and comments, but I ask you to remain tuned in because we are going to have a wonderful, encouraging, and moving video highlighting the women in leadership roles here at the PHRC. Executive Director Lassiter, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Robinson. We want to uh, say good afternoon to everyone here in this beloved community virtual space. On behalf of our chairman, Joel Bolstein, our vice chairwoman who's joined us uh, today, Dr. Yanks, and all of the commissioners, we're happy that uh, people are joining us today. Uh, I just want to say just how uh, thankful that I am of everyone that has organized, uh, caught the vision for the PHRC to once again, for the second year in a row, to highlight amazing women uh, once a week for the month of uh, Women's History Month, though we know women uh, are making a difference. Women are making a difference every single day. And today we're joined by a dynamic executive director, um, and it's a both and for me, not a either or. She's uh, definitely a colleague, but she's a dear friend. Uh, against the backdrop of what we're seeing with the gutting of DEI programs in Alabama and Texas and Florida, uh, she and I both come out of the historical Black college University tradition. We're both graduates of the Johnson C. Smith University, a historical black college in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, she runs the city, uh, I run the state, and together uh, we're trying to change uh, the context for all of humanity. Uh, and so HBCUs matter. I'm also happy to announce really briefly that the PHRC will be launching a HBCU initiative uh, where we will be partnering with Cheney University, Lincoln University, and Delaware State. Uh, more information to come with regards to that. So once again, this is the culmination of what has just been a delightful, very edifying, very educating uh, Women's History Month with some beautiful individuals who just make up the context of being executive directors for these type of commissions. And I agree with you, Dr. Robinson, put on your metaphoric seatbelt uh, because we're getting ready to go back into the classroom and learn from a person who I've admired her, and I might say her twin sister, Ever since they came on the campus of Johnson C. Smith, uh, they graced that campus with dignity and intellect, and this is no hyperbole. So once again, welcome, and uh, we look forward to this presentation. And uh, I just want to say a special shout out to uh, the uh, commissioner who's been on the commission for the longest, uh, Dr. Yanks. She's been a commissioner for 44, 45 years. Happy Women's History Month to you, International Women's History Month. Uh, and thank you for being a mentor. Uh, thank you for pouring into me and pouring into the commission. So I'd be remiss if I didn't share that, but we can take it back over to Dr. Robinson so we can get started with our, our program. Thank you, Zika Director. So we're gonna introduce our featured speaker and I am going to take my time and read this slowly because it's amazing. <laughs> so Kia G is a lifelong Philadelphian and seasoned social justice advocate. In June, 2021, she was appointed by Mayor Kinney as Executive Director for Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations, the city's official civil rights agency. She leads a talented team of professionals committed to enforcing anti-discrimination laws, promoting equality, and resolving community and neighborhood conflicts. She also leads the Fair Housing Commission, an agency charged with addressing landlord tenant disputes. Prior to her current role, she was legal counsel for the city of Philadelphia, representing the city in complex employment discrimination lawsuits. And she is most proud to have obtained a jury verdict on behalf of the city in a case challenging the mayor's diversity initiative. In 2021, 2022, and 2023. Kia was named one of Philadelphia's most influential leaders by the Philadelphia Tribune. In 2022 and 2023, she was named in the top 100 law by City and State Magazine. She was also honored 
as Barista of the Year by the National Stop the Violence Alliance Incorporated in 2019. She serves as Social Action Chair for Quaker City Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and is former president of the Philadelphia Chapter of the National Bar Association's Women Lawyers Division. Please join me in welcoming, giving a warm welcome to this dynamic feature speaker, Executive Director Kia Gee. Thank, thank you. Thank you, LaDawn, and thank you, um, Director, Executive Director Lassiter. First of all, I am overwhelmed with emotion by <laughs> your excitement and, and your introduction, and certainly for um, Chad. I'm just going to call you Chad. Uh, for Chad, for the warm things that you said about me and, and to me. And so I, many people know that um, he and I have worked collaboratively from the start of my time with the commission. And, and I definitely appreciate both his mentorship and his support. So with that said, I will go ahead and start sharing my screen. Just a second here. Okay, let me get this thing right here. All right, um, again, my name is Kia Gee, and um, I am the Executive Director of the Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations. My purpose for the conversation today is to give a quick high-level overview of how to harness your power and demand your rights. And I intend to do that through a quick conversation about how I've navigated certain life experiences, career um, choices and experiences, as well as how I've experienced some workplace obstacles and faced those head on. Um, as part of our conversation, I hope that uh, once I'm done my PowerPoint, that we'll have some questions and I can delve deeper into um, the specific strategies that you need to take as you encounter different obstacles in your own careers. Hold on, I'm gonna try and get this thing to go forward here. Just a second. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, so I bring you greetings from the vibrant city of Philadelphia. And um, as some of you may know, our city uh, recently celebrated a significant milestone. And that milestone was the election of our very first woman mayor. She is the 100th mayor of Philadelphia, and she is also an African-American woman. So it is fitting that I share with you one of the quotes from her that really resonates with me. And it says, I am extremely, wait a minute, my screen's cutting up here, hold on. I am extremely mindful and cognizant of the number of little girls and boys who come from neighborhoods and places where they probably thought, never thought someone like them could ever do something like this. And this quote really resonated with me because it speaks to the raw emotion of becoming successful after growing up in a low income neighborhood and hoping that you give your community something to aspire to. It's even more special for me because in fact, she grew up in the exact same neighborhood that I did. <laughs> she grew up in a neighborhood called in Philadelphia called West Oak Lane. So what I'm showing you right now is um, the, one of the many hubs in the West Oak Lane neighborhood. It's on the intersection of 19th and 72nd Street. Um, so to the right of my screen, at least, you'll see a little mini market and it says TNT. Um, this was one of my favorite places to go to um, as I was growing up because it was a place where you could not, on, not only get groceries, um, and it, um, some of the best hoagies in Philadelphia, I would say. Um, but you could also get advice from the local sandwich maker whose name was Mr. Peewee. Um, 
best of all, it was directly behind my house. So I didn't have far to go. It was a working class neighborhood, um, but like many other poor black uh, working class neighborhoods in the 80s, it was ravaged by the crack epidemic that was sweeping the country. So in neighborhoods like ours, the, uh, the families were mostly single parent, single mother homes, um, and that was pretty much the norm. Um, drugs had a stifling grip on our, on our community. Um, and for a lot of us, the thought or dream of success seemed to be a distant, um, a, a far distant uh, goal. African-American families have struggled, and we all know this because we're social justice advocates, um, African-American families have struggled for generations. Right. Well, and I think that that's always. With persistent poverty. The thing that as, you need to think about is that. Especially in the inner city, thank you. Um, these conditions were further strained um, during the 1980s and 90s by widespread use of crack cocaine. So how did we get there? In the 1940s through the 60s, um, you had tons of African, and I should say, I should preference it by saying this, I am coming from the unique experience of being an African-American woman. So to the extent that I reference African-American families and the African-American experience, I am talking about um, issues unique to me and from my perspective. Obviously, that transcends a lot of different races and um, cultural issues. Uh, but in the 1940s through the 1960s, you had African Americans who came to northern city, cities to pursue industrial or manufacturing jobs. Um, as a result, they were oftentimes forced into crowded neighborhoods uh, through discriminatory practices of illegal, um, now illegal discriminatory practices like redlining. Meanwhile, at the same time, white families were moving into the suburbs and even some uh, black families moved into newly integrated um, suburban communities. So that left high concentrations of poverty in the 1970s. That was due in large part to the fact that the black middle class had left the communities. Um, it also was brought on by the departure of low skill manufacturing positions. In the 1980s, due to the structural disadvantages that existed for, let's see, four, four decades, uh, you saw intensified blight and despair where um, black communities dealt with overcrowded housing. Um, veterans were coming home from the Vietnam War with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, teenage pregnancies were at an all-time high. The high school dropout rate was about 25% and uh, in neighborhoods like mine. And casual drug and alcohol use had begun to uh, soar. Simultaneously, you had uh, the glorification or the glamorization of use of powder cocaine as a party drug for those who were upwardly mobile. All of this created a sort of perfect storm for the use of crack cocaine in the 1980s, uh, which was a cheap form of the drug that could be easily accessed by those um, in, in, in the hood. Um, growing up in Philadelphia, particularly in a neighborhood like mine, which was West Oak Lane, um, was particularly difficult because of the violence that you saw uh, brought on by the crack era. I remember vividly, I was about 13 years old when I became, when I first became a victim of a crime. Um, at the time, I think the rapper LL Cool J had a, uh, had a, a song out on the radio and it was called Around the Way Girl. 
And then that song, he said, I want a girl with extensions in her hair, bamboo earrings, at least two pair. So um, I remember uh, at, when I turned 13, my mother bought my sister and I some bamboo earrings. And so I wore those earrings all the time. And one day my cousin uh, Lori and I were walking down 19th Street. And, you know, as we got, as we approached the, the corner, these guys came up walking behind us. So I was a little, I guess, naive at the time. And I thought, why are they walking so fast? You know, they must have somewhere to go. And so um, as we approached the street, the, um, the street intersection, they walked up and I'm kind of moved to the side to allow them to get past. But just as quick as a blink of an eye, two of them came up behind my cousin and I and snatched both of our earrings and ran in the opposite direction. And so it was um, it was that kind of um, sporadic and um, um, unplanned and uh, incidents of violence that sort of became um, an assault rather that became part of the culture in my neighborhood. Despite um, some of the things that went on in my neighborhood, we had hope. And as Desmond Tutu said, hope is being able to see that there is light despite all of the darkness around you. This is actually the, the house in the middle there is actually the home that I grew up in. Um, it's 1844 Plymouth Street. I pulled this image off of Google. So it looks a little different than um, what it did in the 80s when I lived there. Um, in fact, we lived directly next door that the house that's in blue was a crack house um, and it had caught fire <laughs> through use um, through the people who lived there using using drugs. And it was vacant for about 10 years um, during my, my time um, that I was growing up. So it was vacant about 10 years. One thing my mom always taught us is that no matter what was going on outside of our windows, she had different expectations of us inside. Um, she taught us the value of appreciating what you had and um, making your house a home. Um, and so that was one of the uh, guiding principles for me as I began my adolescence. But if you see from my vantage point, you see two, two homes, I think you see two or three homes in this picture. And I think it's important to note the type of devastation that I saw you know, out, right outside my window. I talked about the house that was next door to us that was a um, a crack house. Uh, and so even, and I talked about the fact that it was um, an abandoned house after a fire, but even with it being an abandoned home, people were still coming in and out of it. I lived directly across the street from um, one person who was a drug addict. She lived on the second house from the corner and right next to her, another drug addict who lived the third house from the corner. So you can imagine the, the incidents of um, despair that we saw on a regular basis. Um, we saw daily intoxication, uh, arguing, violence, uh, hysteria, um, all of those kinds of things. But inside of our home, um, my mother made sure that we had discipline, that we um, were in tune with our goals and that most importantly, we had love. So in the picture you see um, my guy sister, my sister and I um, with black hair, <laughs> which I haven't had in decades. Uh, and then my brother and shout out to the, uh, the popcorn ceiling uh, stucco, if you see it there, the glitter as well. Um, uh, one of the important principles that my mother shared with us or instilled within us growing up was that failure was not an option. Um, my mom was an old school mom. So if you, she would help you study for tests. And if you happen to even get a B on a test, she would say things like, oh, so you just went in the class and signed your name on the test, huh? 
Um, and we would say things like, uh, no, mom, actually, you know, I was kind of fighting for my life to get that B. The whole rest of the class um, failed. Uh, but I appreciated um, the discipline that she instilled in us. And so, uh, like Executive Director Lassiter alluded to, my sister and I uh, were twins. And we... Um, it's really good. I'm sorry. Um, and we... Uh, one of the things that we did was put our academics first, and we saw that as a way to escape the circumstances that we grew up in. Uh, we both were members of the National Honor Society, and we um, were in the early admission program in the school that we attended, uh, Carver High School of Engineering and Science, which gave us an opportunity to finish high school in three years. So we finished high school in three years and received academic scholarships to go to Johnson C. Smith University. Um, just uh, as your uh, executive director said, um, and attended college even at the same time that he did. So we finished college in, we finished high school in three years. We then finished college in three and a half years. Shortly after college, um, we went to a master's degree program and I found myself actually with a master's degree by the age of 23. I began practicing in, or not practicing, um, I began working in the field of social work, social justice, and public health um, at the age of 23. Um, and I got, had gotten married, I had a young son, and then life began to take a turn. Um, I put up the quote that says, in every woman, there comes a time of awakening. So don't be afraid of change because it's leading you to a new beginning. And for me, my awakening moment was in my early 30s where I found myself getting divorced um, from the marriage that I had been in. Um, and finding myself challenging myself to see what it was that would make me happy. And through um, talking with friends, spiritual leaders, uh, therapists, I was challenged to go to a point of looking at what made me happy as a young child. Um, and what made me happy as a young child was always being on the side of right. I always wanted to do the right thing for the right reason. And I knew that there was something in me that wanted to advocate for those who had been wronged. And so I had always wanted to be a lawyer, but I think my mom didn't see that as a viable path. Um, and so I kind of changed to, to conform to what her expectations were. But at that moment, I, in that moment of awakening, I had decided I was going to go to law school and fulfill the dream that made me happy. So uh, in uh, May of 2015, I joined the 2% of African American uh, attorney who practice uh, law in the United States. That was a pivotal, pivotal moment for me. Um, you see me pictured here with my colleagues uh, from law school. You all know that I was appointed, you all heard rather that I was appointed in June of 2021 as the executive director for the Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations. Um, and my experiences as a lawyer um, helped me, uh, pro helped propel me to that position. Um, I had spent my entire legal career uh, looking at practices and policies that worked um, either to support a better workforce for Philadelphia by removing barriers that had, um, by removing uh, bad actors and rectifying practices that led to disparate outcomes for employees. Um, as uh, LaDawn said, um, one of my proudest moments was when I, uh, we obtained a jury verdict for a case that challenged the city's hiring practices, specifically the mayor's diversity initiative. 
Here at the uh, Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations, we are one of the oldest municipal civil rights enforcement agencies. We, are, we were established in 1951 under the city's Home Rule Charter. Uh, we are tasked with enforcing the civil rights laws, particularly the Fair Practices Ordinance and Chapter 9 1100 of the Philadelphia Code. I lead a talented team of uh, professionals who are committed to our mission of fighting discrimination, ensuring equality, and building strong communities. Um, there's an old saying though that goes, don't let anyone who hasn't been in your shoes tell you how to tie your laces. And that resonates for me because um, my advocacy is deeply rooted in my personal experiences of race discrimination, hostile work environment, and race-based um, wage inequity. Right. Oops, I'm sorry. Race discrimination is something that um, as Black women, we oftentimes face. Um, studies have shown that uh, Black women are one and a half times more likely to be sent home uh, from work because of their hair or their appearance. Uh, they are also two and a half times more likely to be perceived as unprofessional uh, or experience microaggressions because of their appearance. Um, and as I was searching for graphics to convey this message, I came across this picture of a young woman in a suit. And um, this picture really resonated with me because it reminded me of certain situations that occurred before I became a lawyer when I faced um, explicit bias from a supervisor who seemed to be prejudiced against young black women. Um, despite, in my experiences, despite my strong qualifications, I, as I said, I had graduated from high school in three years, college three and a half years, had a master's degree, um, and had been working in senior leadership at a very young age. I was met with skepticism about my professionalism. Um, I can recall one instance, uh, for example, where uh, I was responding to a work email during a meeting and I was chastised for not being present, despite the fact that there were at least two older white female colleagues that were in the same meeting knitting. They were knitting um, scarves or you know sweaters or whatever they were doing. And so um, I raised the concern to my then supervisor and I said, you know, I could take the criticism that, you know, I should have been more present, but I wanted to let her know that, you know, I was responding to a work email um, and it was an important message that I needed to send. And I said, you know, but at the same time, you have, I'm, I'm uh, using different names, you have Sarah and Jane and they are in here knitting. And she got so livid. She told me, that's kinetic learning. You, you know, that there's a difference. So just to see the the way that, you know, certain supervisors approached certain people and chastised them for certain things and not others was something that really stood out for me. Um, uh, another uh, moment happened as I said, with the picture, um, I was wearing a, a business suit like that. And um, some of my colleagues, they would come in with sweaters and pants, you know. Um, I, I didn't do that. That just wasn't my personal style. But they would sometimes come in even with jeans. For me, when I wore a pants, a, a skirt suit, she went out of her way to demean me and to make me feel small after a meeting by saying, you know, you really need to watch what you wear. 
And I said, well, what did, what did I wear? What, what's going on? Because I know I had always come in at the height of professionalism. And she said, well, you're wearing a piece of spandex. And so, again, some of these experiences and microaggressions that um, Black women and, and women in general experience are those that fuel me and my passion to advocate for others when I became a lawyer. But even when I became a lawyer, experiences with discrimination didn't uh, stop. I continue to face disparities because of my race. Uh, I remember, and I'm just using this picture as an illustration, but I remember I had a colleague, and I'm changing his name by the name of John, um, when he and I started at this uh employer. <laughs> we started with this employer. We started at the same time. We attended the same law school and we graduated the same year. However, um, I noticed that as we continued in our journey with the employer, he was placed at a higher pay tier um, while I was in the lower pay tier. Uh, he and I both had significant successors for the employer that um, drew a claim throughout you know, the organization, but he continued to climb up the ladder while I, uh, he continued to climb up the ladder exponentially while I had incremental growth, if anything. And so um, I had been active on the DEI uh, committee, of course, I had done work as a discrimination lawyer. And so I felt empowered at that moment to share some of my observations about the bias that I felt was going on. I raised the issue with leadership. I walked into the office. Um, I did not use the colleague's name, but I just asked, you know, what is the process wherein you promote you know, some employees over others. And I was told, you know, oh, we only promote uh, attorneys based on their class, um, the class being the year that they graduated from law school. And um, I said, well, okay, there's another colleague and he and I went to the same law school. We graduated the same year, um, but it seems that he's on a step five while I'm at a step two. And I had learned that he was actually up for a promotion. And the hiring manager at that time said to me, oh, you're talking about John. You can't compare yourself to John because John's a superstar. And for me, that was just the height of both um, uh, of a uh, anger that I had. I'm going to say that was the height of my anger. I was fighting tears. I had a lump in my throat. And I turned to that manager and I said, you know, you only think that John is a superstar because he looks like you. He and I have both been respectful, um, have been successful rather in our own rights. Um, but there's something about him that resonates with you differently. And I had been, I had, uh, one ton, dozens of cases uh, uh, on behalf of the city and saved the city millions of dollars. Um, and so I was empowered when I said that. Um, and I think part of what we face a lot of times, we being women, we being African-American women in particular, is that constant feeling of being unvalued and being the underdog. This picture here that I picked out um, illustrates that uh, when I read the the uh, caption of the article, it said "superstar prosecutor leaving Montgomery County DA's office." Right, and so looking at the picture, I thought to myself, "Okay, well, clearly one must be, I guess, the assistant or the paralegal." And the other must be this superstar prosecutor, right? Because they didn't say there were two superstar prosecutors. When I looked further into the article, uh, it said that both of them were in fact attorneys in the uh, the District 
district attorney's office. But that particular reporter had gratuitously named the ma- the white male uh, attorney a superstar prosecutor and left out any similar uh, superlative for the black female uh, prosecutor. And so um, I thought that that was just a perfect example of some of the microaggressions that we experience uh, in our careers. Part of what fueled me um, in what, and what continues to fuel me in my work uh, with the Commission on Human Relations, as well as my advocacy for uh, marginalized communities. Here in Philadelphia, we have um, protections built into our law that equalize the playing field for all employees, regardless of your gender, uh, your identity, your race, your religion, and 17 other protected categories. But here, I just wanna talk briefly about the protections that exist for women. The first uh, relates to our wage equity uh, ordinance. Under our wage equity ordinance, employers are prohibited from making inquiries into a, a job applicant's wage history and basing their salary offer on the um, applicant's wage history. That is important because if it, it is widely known through studies as well as um, anecdotal evidence that women are among the lowest paid employees in any uh, career path. Um, speaking strictly from a legal standpoint, we know that um, black female lawyers are paid about 53 to 60 cent on every dollar that uh, white male uh, attorneys are paid. And even, even 15%, 15 cent rather, lower than white female um, attorneys. And so relying on wage history will set up a systemic problem for women in particular as they advance throughout their careers. So that's one of the protections. The second is a protection for discrimination based on hair, which harkens back and is closely related to race discrimination. So we're talking about an immutable characteristic that sometimes employers use to describe uh, people as uh, unprofessional, uh, not serious, unkept, et cetera. So under the Fair Practices Ordinance, we uh, extend discrimination protection to hairstyles and hair protect um, hairstyles and hair textures of any length, and that includes hairstyles like cornrows, braids, uh, locks, bantu knots, afros, and obviously um, religious hair coverings as well. We also uh, offer protection against discrimination based on pregnancy status, uh, which is unique, um, which uniquely uh, impacts women. Um, but under our laws, an employer cannot deny a reasonable request for accommodation, uh, force a particular accommodation on an employee, deny employment opportunity, uh, because the employer would have to provide a reasonable accommodation, force an employee to take leave, whether that's paid or unpaid, and they can't take an adverse action on an employee um, simply for requesting an accommodation. Um, we also have protection for victims of domestic violence and sexual violence. Um, again, that um, domestic violence and sexual violence is something that disproportionately and negatively impact women. Um, and so with this protection, employers uh, have to provide leave to women if they are seeking leave from domestic abuse or sexual abuse, and they are trying to seek medical care, psychological care, victim services, safety planning or legal assistance. And they also cannot retaliate against um, women for or 
people rather, for taking that type of lead. And most recently, uh, we built in protection for uh, a protection against rather discrimination based on reproductive health care decisions, meaning that um, there is a protection that extends to women uh, in particular who seek reproductive health care treatment um, like abortion so that they are not uh, so that they do not receive adverse um they are not treated adversely by their employer uh, if they need to take a leave. But even with knowing our rights, we know that there are several reasons why women don't file complaints and why people don't file complaints. This is universal. First, they fear that nothing will change. Um, they also don't want to face retaliation. And then lastly, they fear that they would be labeled a troublemaker. And this is particularly, I find this to be particularly true for women and for minority women in particular who don't want the, um, the fact that they filed a complaint to follow them throughout their career, or they don't wanna mar their career by having filed this complaint. But to all of us, I say, speak your mind, even though your voice shakes. As I said, um, when I described the, the instance that I experienced uh, wage inequity um, based on my race, when I had that conversation, I had a lump in my throat and I was fighting back tears, but I still said it. And I firmly believe that had I not done that, um, I would never have been uh, taken seriously in terms of my uh, uh, in in terms of my um, how can I say this? I would have never. I'm gonna say it plainly. I would have never gotten the promotion that I got because I wouldn't have um, brought that attention, brought that issue to their attention, and they wouldn't have taken it seriously. So say it, even when your voice shakes. When you get past some of the systemic issues that impact women in particular, you've got to deal with imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is not something that happens to us, but it happens in us. And so it stems from a sense of uh, adequacy. I'm sorry. It stems from a, a sense of inadequacy, despite the fact that we are objectively competent um, and we are assured that we are in the positions that we have based on our qualifications. So when you have uh, people who are marginalized based on their language abilities, their ethnicity, their gender, their socioeconomic status, um, that othering oftentimes leads to or fuels imposter syndrome. Um, with that said, we uh, as employers and as advocates also um, increase the likelihood that some will, someone will experience imposter syndrome when we treat other people differently based on their race or their religion, or their sexuality while they're at work. We do have the power to change this, though. We change this by, um, by valuing mental health and self-assurance as much as we value skill um, and, and the other attributes that, uh, that people bring to conversations. We uh, have an opportunity to impact imposter syndrome when we create inclusive work environments uh, and when we advocate for others. And so um, as I go through it, here is, as I quickly go through it, here is my call to action and how you actually use your power. Once you know about the laws, and I encourage everyone to research the laws in your city, in your state, so that you're fully aware because knowledge is power. But once you know those laws, your call to action is to advocate for 
um, for others. You advocate through mentorship, taking the younger generation, the next generation, and um, showing them what their rights are, um, also helping them when they're in certain work situations to understand what um, are the, 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 the uh, do's and don'ts within the office environment, showing them that um, through your actions that you value them, that you appreciate them, that you pour into them. Um, sponsorship, talking about folk uh, in a positive light when they are not in the room. If you're in a position to uh, of influence, using your influence to uplift others. Allyship, when you see something wrong, you say something. Um, because uh, when one person is impacted by discrimination, it doesn't matter what the basis is. Um, that bleeds through the culture of a work environment. And so becoming an ally to other marginalized communities. And then again, voting your conscience, voting for elected leaders who share your vision for society. Um, the Voting Rights Act of night the voting, um, I'm sorry, the Civil Rights Act, I'm talking about the Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, as well as the Housing Act were spawned on, uh, of 1968, were spawned on by elected officials who shared our passion for social justice and reform. And so voting uh, for those who share, share your goals. So as I begin to bring this, um, this conversation to a close or open it up for questions, I wanted to give you some key takeaways. The first is keep your eyes focused on your goals, no matter what your background, no matter what your life experiences. Second, believe in yourself at every stage of your journey. The third is know and understand your rights. Become uh, curious about what's going on in your community and um, look to see what you can do within the confines of the laws that you know to change um, those things that are going on. And then lastly, uh, support and advocate for others. Um, with that said, I know this was really quick, but I want to thank you all for just sharing your lunchtime or your one o'clock hour with me. If you have any questions about the laws that we enforce here in Philadelphia or my personal experiences, and you uh, just would like to talk further, feel free to contact me at any time. Uh, my, my email address is Kia G-H-E-E -E at philo.gov. So with that said, I will turn it back over to you, um, Ms. Robinson, and I guess we'll go through any questions that have come up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Executive Director Gee. I'll give you a little bit of time if you want to grab some water or something like that before we go into any questions or any comments. But um, everything you said, I felt so, so deeply and I've thought for so many years that I was just on this island by myself, you know, trying to understand, like, while well, going into a, a meeting and and uh, everyone else around the room were giving accolades, we're all on the same team. And then when it came to me, oh, I love your nail polish, or oh, I like your hair, and I'm I'm like, well, what happened to my, <laughs> you know, appreciation and, and thank yous and this, my circle of professional friends sit around quite often and talk about, you know, you know, the imposter syndrome. We're all very accomplished, but we all, it seeps in some kind of way. And we just try to just lift each, each other up when we start to kind of feel that imposter syndrome start to sneak up on us and to just remind us, you know, you know, who we are and that we have each other. So thank you again so much for sharing that. I, I want to open the floor uh, to any questions or comments. I'll try to watch the chat as well, but raise your hands. Let's see. Just a comment uh, from a very brief comment. I thank you for your authenticity um, because I grew up Hunting Park, 4433 North 9th Street after moving back uh, to the area in 1986 from South Central Los Angeles. And, 
the pain of the crack epidemic in and around that park uh, has scarred me so deeply that I rarely talk about it. Uh, and so I thank people like you, uh, my best friend, Secretary Khaled Mumin, um, who's always, you know, being mindful of where we come from. I'm mm -hmm. mindful of where I come from um, all the time, uh, but the pain and trauma of uh, aunt, who my cousins were some of the biggest drug dealers in and around Ethan Butler, um, putting their very mother on drugs by selling drugs to her, my dad's sister, has been something that I've kind of stored and compartmentalized. Uh, so I'm always inspired when I'm in spaces like this um, for forms of liberation, which for me is an ongoing process. And so um, that West Oak Lane section that you talk about, I'm living in East Oak Lane now, um, yeah. Melrose. And, and you know, um, it was a working class community like most of these communities. Um, and if you know anything about East Oak Lane, which I know you do, I'm on the same block as the East Oak Lane Library um, and Elmwood Elementary. Uh, and, you know, um, those homes are selling fast and, you know, uh, the gentrifiers are here. Um, yep. But but thank you so much. Um, those uh, what what Elijah Anderson calls in Cold Streets, those old heads and those supermarkets, those poppy stores, those corner stores, they didn't have degrees, but they ta taught us a lot of life lessons on what not to be and to not fall, you know, victim to a lot of the, uh, the, the snares that are there. So once again, just honoring you in that space and always being mindful to, you know, even free myself at this stage of my life to tell, you know, that that story, right? Uh, crack ravaged a lot of the black and brown communities of Philadelphia and trapped a lot of us in that American apartheid zone where we couldn't get out because of various reasons. So once again, just honoring your humanity and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Um, I would say, you know, I, I remember vividly, and this is really quick, I remember vividly um, going through Huntington, I think they call it Huntington Park, <laughs> Huntington Park, um, and you would see the out the use of crack outside, you know, on the basketball courts, sitting on the picnic tables, um, and that just, I used to take the C bus um, to school every day. It's seeing people from about Broad and Stanton all the way down to about Broad and Lehigh using drugs outside and the trauma that is built into that experience when you see that. I didn't share, but I had a dad, my, my father um, struggled with addiction for years. And so in addition to, you know, what I saw going on around me, my father, um, it, his addiction was why my mother was a single mother, because she made the choice to file for divorce and to leave that sort of chaos that consumes people when they're in addiction. And so, you know, we, it, it, a lot of us, uh, we have to appreciate the richness of experience that we have and what we bring to our respective environments so that um, that is honored, you know, and not uh, diminished. And so I appreciate your oppor the opportunity to speak to, to you and, and all those that you've brought on the team. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Executive Director uh, Lassiter, you had asked if our chair was on the call. Uh, I believe he has joined us. Chairman Wolfstein has joined us. Yeah, I always want to create space for our chairman uh, to come in. It's always organic, it's always fluid, um, remarkable human being, um, just like all of our commissioners, all of our PHRC staff. Um, chairman, it's good to see you, sir, and just, you know, just want to give you some space um, on this day as well. I think you might be on mute. OK, thanks. I've had a, 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 an interesting couple of days. I'm glad I can be here with everybody. Um, love the presentation. I've been trying for so long to add diversity to the legal profession. I've been a, a partner in several large law firms, and uh, there's so much more that we need to do. Um, we are taking steps in the right direction, but there's a lot more that can be done. Uh, what I find very encouraging is uh, the percentages of women and minorities going to law school, uh, which leads to more opportunities for women and minorities to, um, to join uh, firms in the legal profession and work their way up to partner, and that's what it takes to change 
the whole profession. Um, it's unfortunately taken longer than many of us would have hoped. And there's a lot that we could all talk about on that subject, and I could talk about it for hours. Um, the difficulties that I faced uh, just trying to convince people that, for example, an African-American lawyer would want to work uh, at a law firm in Bucks County. And then I have people say, well, why, you know, wh how do you know somebody who would want to move to Bucks County to be an attorney? And I say, well, why wouldn't they? You know, it's it's a it's a nice place to live. Um, you know, and then I look at the person, the person who said it, and I, I'd say, you know, if you think about it a little bit more, it that's kind of racist, the way you're thinking. Um, and you have to call people out on that. Um, but it it is, it's lingering. I mean, back when my, when my father was looking to get a job as a lawyer, uh, most of the big firms wouldn't hire Jewish lawyers. Um, so there's been discrimination in the profession for a long time. And a lot of us have been fighting uh, for many, many years, you know, in the State Bar Association and the American Bar Association to change that. And I, I do think, I do think, uh, that change is coming. So we'll, hopefully we'll see it in our lifetimes, um, but it's slow, slower than it should be, and there's more to be done. Um, one thing that uh, really struck me again was the talk about uh, the lack of equal pay, and I put it in the chat, which is we have authority uh, to enforce those equal pay laws, and it's discriminatory to not pay a woman uh, the same amount as a man for the same job, for the same work. And when we do see those cases, I think there's there's things that we could do, but I do think we need to reinforce the message to folks who are out there uh, that uh, they can file complaints in those situations. Um, and that eventually we can build a body of law in Pennsylvania that will show how serious we are about that. So thank you for that. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chairman Bolstein, for those words. And again, I ask: Are there any comments or, or uh, questions for Executive Director Gee? Director Eister, you're on mute. Yes, thank you. Thank you, first of all, Executive Director Gee. Um, your remarks on your mother's emphasis on creating a sanctuary, if you will, in your home, creating a beautiful home despite the external environment, the harsh and dangerous environment you grew up in, really spoke to me in terms of um, illustration and framed how she framed that for her daughters to keep that inner peace as you move forward in life and you are still facing adversity in your professional life. As a mother of four daughters, and as a woman, that really um, was a beautiful illustration. Your mother, I wonder, although you said she wasn't at first happy when, and I may have misunderstood when you took law as your profession, I was curious, one, what are her thoughts now? I'm sure she's extremely proud. And in light of Women's History Month, if I have time for a two-part question, um, who else were your inspirations? It seems that you you had a wonderful family, a very strong family. Um, what other women have you looked up to? Sure. So I think that for my mother, I would say that um, my mother was a strong disciplinarian and she wanted the best for her children. And I only recognize in hindsight now as an adult why she sometimes... Uh, ruled more with an iron fist than with a warm hug. Um, but that was sort of like her, her style. And it was because, you know, the girls that lived down the block from me were becoming pregnant at 14 and 15 years old. Um, and so she was uh, very, very adamant that we needed to be the best when we were in school. We needed to do something and get out, of, get out, and make a success for success of ourselves, um, despite um, what we saw. Um, a lot of the young men they uh, became drug dealers. Some of them went on to have a drug problem. 
I remember um, just recently, uh, two, two, I want to say maybe four years ago, four years ago, I learned that um, two guys that grew up on the street over from us, which was Elston Street, passed away from an overdose. Um, and I'm assuming at this point it was fentanyl or some something like that, because um, as you know, that, that that's one of the highest uh, uh, rates of overdose for fentanyl is among um, black men now between the ages of, I think, 30 and 50, um, because it's being mixed with other um, recreational drugs. Um, and so um, just learning that they had succumbed to drugs, despite the fact that I did my best to get out of that environment, it kind of um, weighed heavily on my heart. And so um, all that being said, I understood why she why she was the way she was in hindsight. Um, but the other thing was my mom didn't want me to be a lawyer because she said that, you know, you're going to have to move far away. Lawyers, there's not a lot of jobs for lawyers and you're going to have to move to California. She told me this at eight. You're going to have to move to California because there aren't a lot of jobs for lawyers. Now, she wasn't wrong. <laughs> there are not a lot of jobs for lawyers. But I just think that when you have a child who's telling you they want to do something, you should support and nurture that dream as opposed to telling them, no, you're not going to do that. She told me, no, you're not going to do that. You're going to become a doctor. Doctor, you know, and so I went to school with that in my mind. If you saw on the little news clip, it was like they're both going to be pre med majors, and we <laughs> were, we were, were pre med majors. Um, but at that point, at that young age, I felt that I was too stressed out. I said, you know what? I did all this stuff. I don't want to go to medical school. I'm just going to get my master's degree in public health, and I want to work in the community and things like that. And so then when I found myself working in the community, seeing some of the issues that were coming up, and then coupling that with the, the personal changes that I was having, I said, okay, here's the time for me to make a change for me. This is the time for me to go back to something that's really going to make me happy and take me to a point of transformation. And that's why I ended up going to law school. Um, with that being said, um, some of my inspirations have always been my family members. My grandmother, who was herself um, 16 years old when she had my mother, um, yet found a way to, and my mother was her only child, but found a way to um, instill and pour into her the values of being a strong Black woman um, and, and also the matriarch of our family who who basically was there for all of us whenever we needed. Um, and so um, my grandmother, um, also I would say my, my former uh, supervisor, Rosalind Edwards, who saw something in me when I worked at Head Start that I didn't even see in myself. Um, she always told me, you know, I was a superstar. She told me I was a superstar. And she said, you know, you're meant to soar. Um, you're not meant to be going to, you know, d digging in the weeds, you're meant to soar. And so she was one of the first people that I sort of looked up to in terms of her command of information, her command of um, issues and her advocacy skills. So, um, and obviously now Kata uh, Justice Kataji Brown Jackson, uh, who was also a Delta like me. Um, <laughs> and so the, she's one of my inspirations and she talks about how her past, she honors her past as she brings those experiences into the court. And she hopes that her colleagues will appreciate the richness of her experience. So those are some of the people who, um, who I uh, look up to. Regional Director Robinson, if we can go um, just briefly to uh, Commissioner Yanks and then jump into our video. But before Commissioner Yanks goes, um, I want to say that Kia, um, there was a lot of us who were seniors who were very jealous of you and your sister when you were at Johnson C. Smith, only because as seniors, we had already had what our GPA was going to be. I graduated with 3.0. To Keenan Smith graduated with a 4.0. We already knew that we were going to graduate. So the last semester of our senior year, we all cut classes. And Blake would <laughs> always say the Philadelphia contingent, because you know it was so small, few of us, they would always say, You all need to be like them geese twins. They come to class, they do all this, they do all that. And we would be like, We're not like them. We're, we're you know, we, we <laughs> but as you know, Keenan went on to work with uh 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 Colin Powell, he went on to lead up the uh detail for Susan Rice. And so 
Johnson C. Smith turned out some wonderful people, and in particular, those of us from Philadelphia, and we continue to get back. Um, and so all that you're talking about now, we saw a little bit of that, but we would always say, we're not those twins. We're, we're cutting class, right? <laughs> but for the, for the virtual space, we cut class only because we were seniors and we had already <laughs> known that we were on our way to grad school. All of us were on UNCF scholarship. Everything was good, but they did it the right way. You all did it the right way, but it's just, once again, such an honor. Dr. Yanks, briefly step in. Uh, you know, if you want to say anything, uh, we want to get to the video, and I know people have to get back to work, but we'd be remiss, uh, Dr. Yanks, if we didn't create this space uh, for you uh, the last day of our, our our version of Women's History Month, though we celebrate uh, DEI for every protected class category here at the PHRC. Anything from you, Dr. Yanks? I'm not sure if she's still on the call. We'll just go to our, our, our queue up our last thing, and we want, you know, Executive Director Gee to stay for this as well. So uh, we'll, we'll we'll touch base with Dr. Yanks uh, some other time. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, Dr. Robinson, did you have any parting words before we go to the video? Uh, thank you, Director uh, Brockman. It's just been an honor. This whole month has just been amazing and exhilarating just to see, you know, four, you know, uh, African-American women who are, you know, leaders of their Human Relations uh, Commission and to hear their stories, their lived experiences. I've learned so much and I uh, just have felt a sisterhood um, to just to, to know that I'm not alone and also have in aspirations and just, it's just been I don't, I'm not very emotional. So I, I, I know I'm going to feel it afterwards. <laughs> I'm probably going to email ED and like, you know, I'm here crying and whatever <laughs> at the office. But, you know, um, thank you, ED, also for giving me this opportunity um, to the MC, uh, the, this, these events. And uh, thank you for everyone uh, for uh, attending today. And you can cue this wonderful video. You're broken down and tired of living life on the merry-go-round. And you can't find a fighter, but I see it in you, so we can walk it out. Move mountains, we can walk it out and move mountains. And I rise up, I rise like the day, I rise up, I rise unafraid, I rise up, and I do it a thousand eight times again. And I rise up, I like the waves, I rise up, in spite of the ache, I rise up, and I do it a thousand eight Silence is a quiet, and it feels like it's getting hard to breathe. And I know you feel like dying, but I promise we would take the world to its feet. Move, bow our bring it to its feet. Move. 